Welcome to the Gary DeMar Blogcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Welcome to the Gary DeMar Blogcast. Today's entry is titled, Catholic Priest Takes on President Biden, Catholic Bishops, and Pro-Abortion Catholics. Father William Costco, a parish priest at St. Henry's Parish in Buckeye, Arizona, unloaded on Roman Catholic President Joe Biden, Catholic bishops, and many Catholic congregants in a blistering homily regarding abortion, same-sex marriage, and transgenderism. He began with a story about the time he was with the U.S. Peace Corps attending a conference in Krakow, Poland, around 47 miles from the Nazi concentration camp in Auschwitz. In this particular article, we find the following. Upon witnessing the horrific history of the camp, Costco explained that those in the group were unable to fathom how people in the neighboring town of Auschwitz, who undoubtedly knew what was happening just a few miles away, could tolerate such proximate evil. They say that one July it snowed there in that town. That snow fell from the sky, but it wasn't snow. It was the ashes from the crematoriums that were working overtime, burning the bodies of the murdered dead. How could people have tolerated this who knew about it? Surely they saw the train boxcars going in with people on them and the people not coming back. Brothers and sisters, he continued, it's 30 years later since I visited Krakow and it's still snowing outside. It's snowing with the ashes of the innocent unborn. After this soul-shattering picture of Nazi Germany and its parallels with the accepted abortion industry in the United States, he mentioned President Biden's support for abortion, homosexuality, and this gender silliness. He said that while President Biden was welcome in his church, his views were not. He said the same thing about the church's members since they would hear the truth about abortion. He then asked, how in the world did this happen? His answer is not atypical of what's happening in churches across the United States. Because our bishops have been silent for 60 years, he said, through bad teaching and cowardice, they have barely said a thing. He apologized if he sounded like he was yelling at them. He admitted he was angry with the same righteous anger that Jesus had when he drove the money changers out of the temple. The entire video is worth watching. See the accompanying article. What caught my attention was the following response by a Catholic woman. I'm going to quote extensively from her, and then I'm going to respond in kind in some comments. Righteous anger or not, she wrote, does not give even a priest the right to use the Lord's name in vain, as he just did. It's one of the Ten Commandments to not take the Lord's name in vain. The priest said, good Lord. This is what she is responding to. And she maintains that saying good Lord is somehow much, much worse than killing unborn babies. But that's the topic uh, that's part of this whole discussion here. She went on to write, passively threatening to ask people to leave his church and insinuating guilt to shame people for their beliefs, Joe Biden or anyone else, is also not Christian. Since he does not have anything for you, I have something from Scripture for everyone who has lost faith over this guy's spiritually immature outburst. Judge not lest you be judged, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The church is not called to be a political entity, she wrote, and it's a blessing to have a Catholic in office leading America. Joe Biden may not be perfect, whoever is, They cast the first stone, John chapter 8, verse 7. And he may be on a journey, as are all Christian people, towards perfection in Christ, who, by the way, is not a fan of the word shame or even shaming anyone. Joe Biden deserves the respect as the President of the United States of America, just as much as any other person smart and fortunate enough to hold the position has ever had. Nothing escapes God's omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient capabilities. That includes all abortion legislation and the person who sits in the White House as commander-in-chief. You don't have to like it, but you don't get to disparage others. 
The best thing peace-loving Christian people can do now is to work for the things they believe in with dignity. The dignity and justice for all, which is guaranteed by our U.S. Constitution. God is love, and loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the revealed truth, the greatest commandment. There are lots of things wrong with these comments, and she wrote some other comments as well, but I'm just going to pick up on a few of them. She also said that politics should not be dealt with from the pulpit. We hear this all the time from lots of people, and these are the same people who continue to use politics in order to push their particular position. And that's what many pastors and theologians in Germany said. Some spoke out, and many of them were arrested. Is the above critic of this parish priest saying that the church should not speak out when evil is being written into law? Using God's name in vain, again, as I mentioned, Father Costco said, good Lord, is when someone like the President of the United States, Nancy Pelosi and Andrew Cuomo, claim that supporting killing unborn babies is something that God of the Bible would support. Using God to justify such evil is using his name in vain. And let's keep in mind, President Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Andrew Cuomo are practicing Catholics who attend church. She uses Matthew 7-1 claiming Christians are not the judge. The Bible does not say this. The Bible actually says, do not judge by the outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment, John 7-24. Matthew 7-2 makes the point that is often missed that we must be consistent in judgment. The standard we use for others must be the same standard for ourselves. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. There's a great deal of righteous judgment going on in the Bible by Jesus. All you have to do, for example, is look at Matthew chapter 23, by Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, and other places, and every other New Testament writer. The question is, Is the judgment righteous? That is, does it square with God's law? She mentions not casting the first stone, an allusion to the woman caught in adultery. Jesus was judging all those involved. The woman had been caught in adultery in the very act, John 8, verses 3 and 4. Where was the man? It takes two to commit adultery. Jesus wasn't requiring complete sinlessness of those who were accusing the woman. Otherwise, there could never be a judgment of anything or anyone. He was pointing out their hypocritical condemnation of only the woman, the very thing Jesus condemns in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. It's possible that among those condemning the woman was the man with whom she had committed adultery. Jesus then tells the woman, from now on, sin no more. So there's enough judgment going around in this particular passage from John chapter 8. Premeditation in the killing of unborn babies is an unseen holocaust. For a president to support such a heinous sin is horrific. The prophet Nathan confronted King David for his adultery and being an accomplice to murder. Why is it wrong to call out the president of the United States on similar moral grounds? Her argument that since God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, Christians are obligated and justified to sit back and wait on God to act. You don't have to like it, she wrote, but you don't get to disparage others. Let's take her claim and apply it to some other situations. You don't have to like slavery, but you don't get to disparage slave traders. You don't have to like exterminating the Jews, but you don't get to disparage Adolf Hitler and his Nazi enablers. You don't have to like Jim Crow laws, but you don't get to disparage those who implemented them. You can see the logic here is illogical and outside the bounds of any sort of moral consideration. Just because God is omnipresent and omniscient doesn't mean that we sit back and do nothing in the face of injustice when we are confronted with it, literally face to face. Love always seems to come in as a substitute for law, even though the Apostle Paul defined love in terms of the law. I'm quoting here from Romans chapter 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. 
So the question comes down to how do you know you're loving your neighbor? By keeping the law, by not stealing from your neighbor, not committing adultery with your neighbor, and not murdering your neighbor. Loving your neighbor includes people who engage in homosexual relationships since you shall love your neighbor as yourself is found in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 which is sandwiched between passages that condemn homosexuality in Leviticus 18:22 and Leviticus 20 verse 3 loving your neighbor as yourself also includes loving your unborn neighbor and the women who have been told that it's okay to kill their unborn babies their closest neighbor Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gary DeMar Blogcast. If you haven't heard, Gary DeMar's American Vision is coming to the Canon app. That means audiobooks are on the way. Audio and video content are already found in the app. So if you don't have the Canon app yet, go to the app store of your choice, download it and subscribe to get not only everything that Canon Press is up to, but also classics from the American Vision store.